Good morning. Today is Monday, February 20th, 2023. Today we are reviewing the world's 10 most expensive watches. Marco, good morning. How are you? Doing well. How are you, Avi? Another beautiful day at Luxury Bazaar. Um, I wanted to bring you on here to talk about the 10 most expensive watches in the world. The DuPont Registry magazine just shed some light on the niche, the niche, the niche. How do you pronounce it? <laughs> niche. 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 niche, niche, yeah. niche. niche. There's, it's either niche or niche. Yeah, <laughs> either or. Yeah. <laughs> the niche market of eight-figure watches offered only to the most exclusive clientele directly from the manufacturer. Let's get right into it. I want to take get your take on these. Number one, the first one, I'm going to share this with you, is the Graf Hallucination, priced at $55 million. Yeah, it's a hallucinating price <laughs> tag that goes along yeah. with it. But uh, I, I mean, I've never seen this watch before. I mean, you're just showing it to me now. This is probably the first time I've seen it. But in terms of, I mean, the stone quality, I'd imagine, is where the, the big price comes in. And uh, also matching, color matching all these stones. I'll tell you all about it, actually. Um, so the Graf Hallucination first debuted on the market in 2014 as the most expensive watch ever created. The entire construction of the timepiece features over 110 carats of rare diamonds and stone, completely covering the platinum bracelet in rainbow style design. The hallucination remains in the ownership of the controlling shareholder of the South African Diamond Corporation, Lawrence Graff. Although the watch focuses on the beauty behind the precious, precious stone, stones, its small quartz dial is hidden inside multiple small pink diamonds in the center of the piece. Um, as clearly seen here. Yeah. Is it weird to put a quartz watch in a $55 million watch? Like, hey, I need the battery change on this thing. <laughs> you know what? Not really. So this is technically, I mean, I mean, I guess it might be unisex, but in, in most cases it would be. A I don't think of, that's unisex. Yeah, it's, it's mo more so of a ladies watch. And for the most part, you know, prior to, I would say, the modern watch market, you know, the last recent years, most ladies pieces were quartz watches, right? Yes. Because they didn't want to wind the watches or, you know, they didn't want to, Correct. for example, have an automatic watch for a lady and so uh, th that definitely makes sense for the time that this was made but yeah this is I mean these jewelry pieces you know AP will make them Patek will make them all, all the major houses will make what what are called the joaillerie in French or their jewelry pieces and that's what I was gonna call them typically yeah. have the the huge price tag uh, that you see on this watch uh, so the question here and I don't know I don't have the answer for this is the price of 55 million dollars since it's actually hasn't it hasn't been sold it's owned by the, the owner of graph is that a real number he could have said it's it's a hundred million dollars yeah, I mean, it could be fabricated by the brand. It could just be, you know, the cost of the stones, uh, you know, the, essentially what they would sell each individual stone for, uh, and then, you know, essentially bundle that price together because it is 100 carats of diamond. Yeah, so I just wonder if it's legitimate. Like, if I wanted to buy this watch, for, if I had the $55 million, would he even sell it to me? Probably not. I think they're probably just keeping it as like a statement piece for the, the brand itself, just to use it. I'm sure it was used purely for marketing purposes. Yeah, it seems like something that would end up in a museum. Yeah, likely. Number two on the list is the Patek Philippe Grandmaster Chime, reference 6300A-010, priced at $33 million, $616,493. I know you're a fan of this. Yeah, no, this I, I know quite a bit about this watch. So this was sold at Only Watch Auction, I believe, in 2019. Uh, it was sold for 33 million. Only Watch being a charity auction, actually. So all the pro, or the majority of the proceeds went to uh, to charity. And this watch is very special for a couple of reasons. Obviously, it's a Grandmaster Chime from Patek Philippe, but it's also done in stainless steel, um, mm -hmm. which is an important fact about the watch itself. And then it also broke the record for the most expensive wristwatch ever sold, recorded sold, right? Because obviously the Graf Correct. is the first one. This is actually a recorded sale uh, again at auction it broke the record that was previously held by the Paul Newman Daytona for 17 plus or almost 18 million uh, so yeah the Grandmaster Chime by, by Patek Philippe is I mean it's a one-of-a-kind watch it literally says one-of-a-kind on the dial itself so some information about the watch from the DuPont registry itself the Patek Philippe Grandmaster Chime was originally launched in 2014 to celebrate the company's 175th anniversary the first and only example to be made in stainless steel features 20 complications including five acoustic functions two of which are patented global premieres, an alarm that's, that strikes the pre-programmed alarm time and a date repeater that sounds the date on demand. 
The Grandmaster Chime also includes a double-faced case design that is quickly reversible using Patek Philippe's patented reversing mechanism. This is where you actually turn the, the dial, and there's another watch, I guess, yeah. behind there? Yeah, exactly. And you see some of these uh, kind of examples. You know, Jay-Z has mm -hmm. uh, a version of the 6300G, and then also uh, Mark Wahlberg has one, one also. They made a black and white dial, and then there's a blue one. I forget what the reverse side. It might be white also. Interesting. A similar watch. Beautiful watch. Insane. Number three on the list is the Breguet Grand Complication Marie Antoinette, priced at $30 million. Did I mispronounce that whole thing? No, that's all, all <laughs> correct. Yeah, you got it all. So interesting story about that watch. So when that watch was first made or was first commissioned, I see it was for Marie Antoinette, who was the husband or the, the wife of the, the King of France at the time. And Breguet didn't even have a chance to finish this pocket watch before she passed away and then before he passed away. So it was actually his son who completed uh, the, the pocket watch itself. And this one uh, specifically, I believe it was in a museum and it was stolen. So it was mm -hmm. stolen out of a museum. And then Breguet actually made a replica of that same one. Uh, and then they ended up finding it uh, recently. I forget, uh, maybe a decade ago. Uh, so yeah, the, the, the watch itself, I mean, it's a one of a kind watch. It just showcases why Abraham Louis Breguet is the greatest watchmaker of all time. I mean, it's a beautiful, beautiful timepiece. And for those that are listening, not, not watching this, um, it's a pocket watch. So first and foremost. It's a skeletonized pocket watch. It's absolutely stunning. The, the, the visuals, the finishing, as you like to say, it really is a piece of art. Um, some recent news about the watch in April 2000, I guess not so recent, but in April 2008, after four long years of research and reconstruction, the new Marie Antoinette timepiece was proudly placed in its impressive presentation case, carved from the wood of the very, of the very Versailles oak tree under which the, the queen once used to rest. So that's, that really, completes the whole package. You have the, I mean, yeah. again, it's not the original watch. It is a reprodu reproduction of the watch, yeah. but now it's in a case made from the tree that she rested under. Yeah, again, this is another watch that will never be resold, right? So for one, yeah. done for kind of marketing purposes by Breguet because they could. And then again, I mean, I think you hit on all the points, right? The fact that this was made originally, you know, we're talking about the late 1800s, early, uh, late 1700s, early 1800s, and it was completed closer to the mid 1800s. I mean, it's a watch that's way ahead of its time, right? So, I mean, so impressive. I'm going to let you pronounce the name of this one because you will definitely do it justice right. where I would not. Tell me. All right, we got the GG Le Coultre Joaillerie 101 Manchette. I was going to say it just like that. <laughs> exactly. Oh, my God. So, this watch is priced at $26 million. Um, the interesting thing about this watch, and uh, let me, I guess, read off so that before sure. we get into the actual conversation about it, showcasing. <laughs> Just say JLC. Yeah. Yeah. Showcasing JLC's talents as technical craftsmen, the its 101 collection was launched in 1929 to offer the world's smallest mechanical caliber. The 101 stands out as a pinnacle model for the brand as it includes over 576 brilliant cut diamonds through its minuscule square design. Now this watch and, and the band as you, you know from if you get to see this, it's made out of a, a bunch of tiny little squares. Um, Lost in its small-scale construction is a single square that holds JLC's miniature movement. It's tiny, like legit, you know, probably a quarter inch by a quarter inch. Size of a fingernail. Yeah. Um, this watch holds some significance as it was created for Queen Elizabeth II, 60th year as a leader. Right. Um, now, take a look at this watch and see, take a look at where the actual... Yeah, watches. You, you can actually see like the small carve out of where the actual time on the watch is. But again, this is another example of what we call joaillerie pieces in, in, in watchmaking. So essentially what a brand does will create a jewelry piece that also has, you know, a timekeeping function. But yeah, this is more so a huge price tag because of obviously the, the intensive yeah. work involved. Yeah. Now, is it also a feat that they, you know, created the smallest movement, you know, I Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, because you have to understand already to make a watch, right? I mean, you're working for the most part with pieces the size of, you know, a fingernail mm -hmm. essentially, right? And then you you miniaturize even that. I mean, you're you're literally working on microns essentially, right? I mean, the the ability to adjust the timing functions even just to make it work is is a marvel in and of itself. I wonder how you set that watch. That's a good question. Yeah, what if somebody asks you what the time is? Like, <laughs> I have no idea. I have, just pull out your you loop know, or your magazine. I just know this watch is 226 million dollars. <laughs> yeah. Um, next on the list is a relatively famous watch. It's the Jacob & Co. Billionaire, priced at $18 million. Now, this it actually sold for this much. Um, 
Unofficially. Unofficially. Yeah. You know, since its introduction in 2015, the Jacob & Co. billionaire has reached fame as the watch coveted by all, with a price tag surpassing 18 million. With only one in existence worldwide, the billionaire is a unique piece adorned with emerald cup diamonds with an approximate car carat weight of 260 carats. The billionaire features a one minute tourbillon and the diamonds are all set by hand one, by one gem setter over the course of many man hours. How beautiful is this thing? I mean, it's in insane. I think this is owned by Floyd Mayweather, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken, right? So this is a billionaire watch. Obviously, the, the official listed price is $18 million. I highly doubt that, that Floyd Mayweather paid anywhere near that price. Um, but the watch itself is a marvel of, of jewelry specifically, right? Because you have to take into consideration, you have to color match each stone, right? Because if you don't have the same clarity, the same look to it, mm -hmm. the issue is, is it will look so fun, like it'll look so weird. And so just defining all those stones to color match each other, and then on top of it, setting them, cutting them to the right, you know, precise measurements. I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's a marvel in and of itself in terms of the jewelry setting. And then obviously the watchmaking involved is great, you know, turbion movement. Movement. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a good-looking watch. It's not something I would ever wear. Tell but. me, what is a one-minute tourbillon? Yeah, so one-minute tourbillon, essentially what you have is a, ro a cage that rotates the, uh, the escapement, essentially, and it will rotate it once every 60 seconds. Now, this is what's typically done, uh, at least in, in modern watchmaking, usually because you want to use the tourbillon cage or there's a hand that points to the seconds, right? So you mm -hmm. can use the tourbillon cage as a rotation uh, to count you know, how many seconds have gone by in a minute. Um, but there's a ton of different variations. Grubel has a 24-second tourbillon. There's some that are uh, even, they have a double tourbillon, which is a 60-second tourbillon within a four-minute tourbillon. Uh, so yeah, there's, there's been a ton of different variations, but 60 seconds is the most commonly used. So, and Jacob & Co. is known for being one of the best, if not the best, gem setters and uh, just, you know, designers of these jewelry pieces. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, our next one is a Vacheron Constantine reference 57260, priced at $8 million. Um, before I ask you about this watch, I'm, I'll read some information. This, the reference 57260 pocket watch features six layers of technical excellence that result in an astonishing 57 complications, which include multiple calendars and a double retrograde split seconds chronograph. The complex dial design is housed in a 98 millimeter case crafted from 18 karat white gold. The 2,800 parts were completely hand decorated by one single master watchmaker using tra traditional techniques. Yeah, I think I, I've seen this before. Yeah, so this is a huge. By the way, this pocket watch is massive. Like this, this is not a pocket watch at all. This is like a. This is like a back pocket you know, watch. You know, like Flava Flav, like the the claw. That's that's literally what that is. That's that's that. So this watch, if I'm not mistaken, at the time of its release, was the most complicated watch ever made. So it even surpassed Patek Philippe's kind of Henry Graves uh, super complications. All those. I mean, it even has like, if I'm not mistaken, Hebrew calendar on it. There's a, there's a ton of. Wow. It, it's insane. Like the the amount of. I mean, 2,800 parts. It just goes to show you, but yeah, a testament to the incredible watchmaking of VC. <laughs> this is the ultimate flex. <laughs> I mean, it's it, it's beyond a flex, right? Because it's a, a one-off watch that will never be made again, you know. So yeah, uh, at eight million dollars, it definitely sounds like it, it's worth it. Yeah, it, compared to some of the other pieces we've seen here. Yeah, I mean, take sure. this compared to the Jacob and Co. I mean, I'd rather have this two of these. For the price of that one i mean they're almost impossible to compare you know because one is you know i, I guess like a, a incredible feat of watchmaking the other incredible feat of jewelry but yeah I, I agree with you for sure next one on the list is probably the most famous one it's the patek philippe nautilus 5711 tiffany and co <laughs> uh the official price that it sold at auction for was six million five hundred three thousand five hundred dollars um, it shocked the world in 2021 after Patek Philippe announced its, exclu its exclusive series that featured vi a vibrant blue dial. Demand for the $52,635 stainless steel watch grew when Patek Philippe revealed that only top Tiffany & Co. clients would be offered a collaboration piece. The very first public sale of the Patek Philippe you know, slash Tiffany & Co. 5711 came courtesy of a benefit auction from Sotheby's. The sale ended with a final selling price of six million five hundred three thousand five hundred dollars. Since then, we've seen this, you know, we've seen this watch on the wrist of LeBron James, Mark Wahlberg, Jay Z, and many others. You know, yeah. Leo DiCaprio is another one, if I'm not mistaken. He Leo DiCaprio it. had one. I think one. John Mayer also has one. Did he? He, may, yeah, he may have. He probably has um, one. I would be shocked if he didn't. So the 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 CEO of LVMH, you know, made it famous in his Instagram. You know. Yeah, that was a one off piece that he made. He so got this dial really stands out. It is a gorgeous watch. 
Um, I know I, I just recently spoke to Adrian about this, and he said right now going price is about two and a half, three million dollars. No, it's well over three million. So, so the watch like this, first of all, I mean, it's very difficult to find, especially nowadays. They're just not trading hands uh, like they used to. Now, that auction uh, specifically, if I'm not mistaken, the person who bid the six million plus actually ended up pulling out at the end. And then it went to the second bidder, the Zach. other bidder. Zach. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it ended up going to that second, uh, to Zach, who was the second second bidder, uh, second highest bidder uh, at that auction. And yeah, that, I mean, listen, that one specifically is an interesting one. We've had that watch and I've handled it. Listen, it's personally not my favorite thing because you know what it is, right? I mean, we're talking about a stainless steel Nautilus, right? For six million dollars, it's hard for me to see like the the value in that. I mean, we just talked right. about a VC with twenty eight hundred components for eight million versus you know a basic stainless steel Nautilus. But I understand obviously the flex of it, the the obviously the fact that it, I think it is also a charity auction, yeah. uh, if I'm not mistaken. So all those all those factors definitely play into the price for sure. And the, the timing of the release could not have been better. It could not have been one hundred percent. The value here is just the value of exclusivity. Yeah. The fact that you are wearing a watch that LeBron James has on his wrist, Mark Wahlberg, you know, Leonardo DiCaprio, like the fact that you are in that small club of people, that's when you pay the price. And the one at auction also, I believe, was number zero zero, right? So it was the prototype. Okay. So you you're buying Larry the first one yeah. ever made. Next on the list is one that um, our friend Nico, who was recently here, would not be a big fan of. It's the Hublot Big Bang. It's priced at $5 million. Now, this is oh, yeah. actually known as the $5 million Big Bang. Um, Owned by Jay-Z. It was commissioned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Commissioned by Beyonce. Commissioned by Beyonce for Jay-Z. Yeah, mm. yeah. I don't think there's any public pictures of him wearing it. Yeah, I don't I don't think so either. Yeah. I think there might have been one, but uh, yeah, no, I, I don't know. I don't know of any other than, than the one. But yeah, that, that watch there, I mean, again, it's, it's more so a jewelry piece than anything else. I mean, the fact that it's five million, who knows what resale is, probably. Uh, the fact that it's owned by Jay Z, I Correct. don't think it will ever be resold. Unless, so, you know, it's know. 18 karat white gold construction is littered with 1,282 diamonds that flow throughout its dial, case, and bracelet. The exclusive diamond Big Bang was originally purchased by Beyonce Knowles for her music mogul husband, Jay Z, to celebrate his 43rd birthday. I have a 43rd birthday coming up. <laughs> can, can, <laughs> can somebody commission what? one of these? Uh, maybe not a huge blow, but. Um, <laughs> To this day, it remains the most expensive Hublot ever made. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, no doubt. One of the most expensive watches ever. Again, color matching the stones is a feat in and of itself. Uh, next on the list is the, you know what, I'm going to let you pronounce this one. I know I could do it, but you All could right. do it better. It's Louis. Uh, that word is actually very difficult for, even for me to pronounce. It's Moinet Meteorist Collection. I've never seen this before, actually. So the watchmaker is recognized for the birth of the chronograph in 1816 and was originally officially awarded by the Guinness World Records organization. Although its high, highest price timepiece comes as a collection of models rather than just one individual, the Louis Monet, Monet, Monet Meteoris line is comprised of four unique tourbillon models inspired by the solar system. The one-of-a-kind offering includes the tourbillon Mars, tourbillon Rosetta Stone, tourbillon Asteroid, and tourbillon Moon, all of which incorporate pieces of raw meteorite material. Interesting. So it's a collection of watches, Correct. I guess. It's four watches. I got you. Okay. Yeah, that makes no. sense. Obviously, you know, finishing. Yeah, no, it's, it's going to be high-end watchmaking for sure. Um, you know, I, I first of all, I don't know how many. Do you know how many they made? I have no idea. Yeah, this is all the information that's available about this watch. Interesting. Yeah. So I, I would assume the set is either a one-off set or maybe they only made a handful at best. So yeah, I mean, the the price tag obviously is justified. You have gem setting. You have the complication. You have obviously the rare materials also involved. So yeah, I mean, it, it definitely makes sense. So we recently had that uh, Lange collection. You know, of, of watches. Was it the Lange one? Yeah. Yeah, so, F. P. Jorn. Yeah, no, F. F. P. Jorn. That's yeah, right. F. P. So, Jorn set. so the fact that as a set, it's clearly worth a lot more. You're getting, yeah. you know, a, you know, in that Magic case, it wasn't cereal. one of a kind, but yeah, exactly. it was very limited. Same thing, I'm assuming with this. For sure. Yeah, you want to have, you know, if you're going to have a collector set, you want to have matching serial numbers, mat, you know, essentially everything that that comes with the set, original to that set, right? So, so that's why obviously the one that we had that sold sold at a huge premium versus like if you were to sell each one individually, kind of thing. Um, next one on the list, and I believe this is the, the last one, priced at $2,580,000 is the Frank Mueller Eternitas Mega. Um, the Eternitas Mega demonstrates the pinnacle of success for the Swiss watchmaker, taking shape as its most expensive and complicated model of all time. With 36 complications and 1,483 components, the Eternitas Mega's Mega is a wonder of micro-mechanic 
and watchmaking know-how. It's 42 millimeter shaped case, to no shape, to no? To no, yeah. To no, to no shaped case features an 18 karat white gold design, while Frank Mueller adorns, adorns the dial with an array of function style and traditional font. The Eternatus Mega was designed to blend modern design with the pure traditions of Frank Mueller's oldest examples. So the case shape is very familiar. Yeah, no, I've seen this watch before. So if I'm not mistaken, this was Frank Mueller, but he also had another watchmaker, I think it's Mich Pierre Michel Golet. Uh, who worked on this also uh and yeah at the time of this watch's release it was the most complicated wristwatch ever made so 36 complications i think it was only surpassed uh by the grandmaster Triumph by patek philippe um so yeah no doubt about it i mean it just goes to show you i see frank muller is the known as the master of complications mm -hmm. and this is part of the reason why yeah. i mean uh, again uh, the price tag for this watch seems legitimate i mean yeah, no doubt. So uh, one thing that's lost on people is uh, the modern Frank Muller brand is not what it was, you know, when Roman started in the business, right? He says this all the time. Frank Muller was the brand to collect back, you know, 20 years ago. And Frank Muller was one of the pioneers. We think we talk about, you know, uh, independent watchmaking. We think F.P. Jorn and all these guys. But F.P. Uh, F. Jorn was working right alongside Frank Muller. Even Frank Muller, I would say, rose to prominence before F.P. Jorn. Uh, now, obviously, he's not really part of the company anymore, and he doesn't really direct much. Uh, and I'd say it's been like that for the last basically two decades, which you know kind of caused the fall of Frank Muller to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. And I, I'd say, listen, back in the day, there's no doubt about it. He was one of, if not the best watchmakers in the world. I mean, he inspired yeah. Richard Mille. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure many others as well. No doubt. Yeah, you know, but that the, Richard Mille is the clearest example, just due to the case shape. Yeah. Um, that's our top 10 most expensive watch list currently. Um, I'm assuming in the next few years, we're gonna see some new additions to this list. Just as the, the Jacob & Co watch came out of nowhere, I'm sure something you know, will come out and, and change this list again. So I'd love to do this episode you know, again when we have that updated list. Marco, thank you very much for joining me today and providing a lot of insight on these watches. Guys, if you like this episode, if you are joining us, you know, if this is your first time, make sure to subscribe, make sure to comment, like, review the podcast if you're listening. Let us know that you like this and we'll continue doing these every single day. Other than that, have a great week and we'll see you tomorrow. Marco, see you later. Thank you.